So we are in session number five. Uh, we have two uh, speakers, uh, and I would like to kindly remind the speakers that uh, you've got uh, 50, uh, 15 minutes uh, for your presentations, and then we'll have like 30 minutes to discuss your uh, presentations, your uh, visions and interpretations. Uh, so um, the first person to um, um, to give a speech uh, will be Erika De Vivo. Um, um, uh, Erika will be talking about uh, a summit space in Tromsø. Hi. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Sure, we can see you and we can hear you. Um, first of all, I would like uh, to thank you, the organizers, uh, for uh, you know putting so much effort uh, into this uh, conference uh, despite the difficult times. Uh, and uh, I would like also to thank you for uh, allowing me to take part to it uh, uh, online. So, as the title of uh, my presentation suggests, I shall address today um, the provocative art project Merra Rick uh, by writer Sigvin Skoden and architect and visual artist Jorn Ango. Uh, this art project was presented at the 2017 Kano uh, Festival in Trumso. And due to the limited time, I shall analyze only specific aspects of uh, its visual and written content in order to give an idea of the author's intentions and of the political overtones of this project. Um, these political overtones are actually the recognition of the presence and the bestowing of visibility to Sami people in Trumso. Anyway, so where are we? We are in Sapmi, <laughs> to go back to the um, geographical location. So Sapmi is uh, the ancestral homeland of the Sami people, and it's actually on this area here, the northern parts of uh, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and the Kola Peninsula in Russia. Um, the art project was actually taking place in Trumso, which is this tiny island uh, roughly here, and uh, on Trumso yeah, there is the city of Trumso. The Mary Ricard project, this is it, and uh, uh, I, well, um, it was first distributed as a brochure to the public, now it's available online, and uh, it was also presented to the public to a performance during the festival itself. There was a Sami actor playing uh, the real estate developer. This art project challenges mainstream Norwegian understanding of Sami culture and their position in the city and in society. This project provocatively plays uh, with the concept of visibility and visibility of Sami culture in this Arctic city, which is Trumso. Uh, honestly, visibility and visibility of Sami cultures have emerged as a core concept during my fieldwork. And I would like to start, though, uh, with a brief outline of the, uh, some elements of uh, recent Sami history, because I think they are important to understand uh, the Meradika project overall. So, for centuries, the Sami have entered the forced conversion, which led to the demonization of Sami non-Christian worldviews. Uh, they endured colonization and stigmatization at the hands of the Nordic nation states. Um, sorry, I will enlarge it. Here, we can see a frame from the film Sami Blood, and uh, the main character is undergoing a very invasive uh, procedure, which is a physical measurement, because Sami people were believed to be inferior to the Nordic people, and this inferiority was believed to play out also in physical features. So this is an example of how these violent processes led to the internalization of feelings of shame and humiliation. And for the reason, uh, many Sami they decided to hid their own identity to avoid being recognized as Sami themselves. Then Sami identity became a private matter or it became invisible. Um, in my opinion, it was forced into invisibility in order to survive. So um, out of shame, many parents no longer taught Sami languages to their children. And many Sami, especially since World War II, grew up without speaking the language of their ancestors, uh, even though many had a passive knowledge of the language itself because they heard uh, their parents uh, speaking. Through the 20th century, Sami activists uh, fought against uh, state-led assimilation policies, uh, trying to bring Sami identity back into the public arena. 
and trying to make it visible again against the pervasive and interiorized feeling of shame so many Sami had to endure. And this is the case, uh, for instance, of Elsa Laula Renberg, who fought against uh, this kind of uh, stigmatization. In the 1970s, uh, there is this uh, slogan here that was coined. It's uh, CSV, Chai uh, Hot Sami Wojnia, Show the Sami Spirit. And I think it encapsulates very well this need for the Sami to be again acknowledged and visible in society, in Nordic society. So, with these elements in mind, I shall now address Merarica by Indige Corp. Indige Corp is a fictitious multinational housing developer company supposed to develop a Sami district here in the center of Trums. So, as you can see, this is the island. The city spreads all across the island, but this is the center. And Merarica would be at the center of the center. So, uh, Nerarica, it's actually a very interesting name because it bears a very evocative um, uh, memory of uh, uh, the place itself, uh, because it means uh, land by the sea, but also it's a reference to ancient reindeer herding practices and routes uh, disrupted by colonial practices, uh, such as, for instance, the institution of borders. Uh, it gives away the political implications of this project, uh, and so does, I think, uh, the caption itself, which is uh, the best of two words. This caption sheds light uh, on the political overtones of Merarica, because it reverses uh, the difficult and different positions uh, Sami people living in cities have uh, still to endure. The brochure actually opens with a quotation, which is this one, and it's a quotation from Joan Turi, which is uh, one of the most famous Sami artists. He lived at the beginning of the 20th century, and he is a well-known also among Norwegians. It's a well-known name. Um, at a closer analysis, actually, this passage uh, reveals itself not as a quotation, but uh, it has been written by Sigbjorn Skoden himself. Uh, he used the, the authoritative figure of Turi to help construct this passage as uh, authentic. Uh, actually, this is a counter-narrative to colonial history of their region. As you can see here, they say, then someone came and divided the land. And there is also a reference to the Merarica, the division between uh, the uh, Bajerica and the Merarica. So, um, now I would like to show you how Merarica would have looked like uh, upon competition. I think that the spatial organization is very important. We can see that uh, uh, Merarica is actually detached from the city. And here the isolation though is voluntary. Uh, we have to bear in mind that for many, many centuries, uh, the Sami have been uh, isolated. And uh, in the uh, early 20th century, sorry, there is a cat. In the early 20th century, uh, the Swedish institutions uh, uh, decided uh, the, to implement a policy that it was known as lap scalvare lap, the Sami should be Sami. Uh, to isolate the Sami, was, culture was big to be dying, and in order to be preserved, should be uh, kept away from the mainstream society, a bit much like uh, the uh, North American uh, um, reserves. So uh, here, uh, as I said, the isolation is voluntary and Merarica proposes itself as a Sami community within the wider Tromso community, which is here, as we can see. So Merarica, it's actually symbolically and ironically claiming back the area as Sami, um, which is actually an issue uh, of um, various debates in the area. Here we have the entrance uh, through a gate, a wooden gate. Then we have the different buildings. There are facilities uh, such as schools, uh, kindergarten, common kitchens, uh, and a library. And there are also these uh, social spaces here. We can see the tents. Uh, these are called Labu in Sami, and they are today used uh, during social gatherings uh, and festivals. In the past, uh, there used to be the portable uh, um, structures uh, for Sami who were uh, herding reindeer. So, as I said, here we have these uh, that have been re-cementized and uh, given new meaning in this context. So, reindeer. Reindeer um, are today an important symbol of Sami identity. Many may associate Sami with reindeer, even if only 5 to 10 percent of Sami people are actually active in this subsistence activity. Nevertheless, it's a very important symbol today. And uh, um, it's evoked in the structure itself of Madarica, because we can see here, this is the plan, and it actually resembles the shape of a reindeer horn. This same reindeer horn is actually the uh, backbone of Madarica itself, uh, connecting all the different activities that take part there, and different cultural expressions, such as the gakti, 
that is the Sami dress, which varies according to where the Sami is from. Other activities are, um, for instance, uh, fishing or uh, um, reindeer butchering and Sami duoji, the Sami handicraft. So now I would like to peek inside one of these uh, houses. And uh, this is an example of the interior design. Uh, we, this is a kitchen and we have a semantization of Sami non-Christian elements uh, into symbols of Sami identity and pride. We have uh, here the um, Sami drum, here there is a goddess on the fridge, the guy is wearing a gakti, and here there is the reproduction of uh, um, uh, carved horn, Edwoji. Here we have uh, some goddesses for instance, and even the pattern here reproduces Sami patterns. Uh, the kitchen, though, it's quite modern and it's what you would find in a normal uh, Norwegian or Nordic house. So it's also to show that the Sami are uh, modern and live normal lives against the stereotype of Sami as uh, um, nature people living almost in a state of nature themselves. Uh, here also there is another important element. This is how the house would look like from the outside. And uh, I think this is actually a picture which uh, has many layers of meaning because we have here this, uh, this is the church. This is the actual ice cathedral um, of Trumso, which dominates uh, Trumsdalen. And uh, this is a symbol in a way of colonial uh, institutions because the church was a very important uh, colonial tool for uh, the colonization of Sapmi. Uh, here it's counterbalanced though by Trumsdalstein, which is the mountain dominating the valley, and which also was uh, um, a symbol and the sacred mountain for the local Sami communities. Here on the wall, there is the sun, the Beavi, which was an important symbol in Sami non Christian worldviews. So this is a fictitious project, but in reality, Sami visibility in Trumso would increase if there were a Sami who's as there is in Ujla. There are many Sami institutions in Trumso, but the Sami house would definitely show the presence of Sami as a community in town, as it does in Oslo or Ujla. This is uh, the symbol of the Sami who is in Ujla, and we can see again the Beavi, the sun, the Lavu, as in the coat of arms of uh, Harashok, but also we can see the landscape and the skyline of Oslo, Ujla. So all these elements are merged together to symbolize the Sami identity of uh, uh, people living in Ujla. So uh, now I would like to show you this uh, slide and uh, address visibility, which uh, in Trumso during the year is an individual choice. Wearing a gakti or a sami dress uh, is a political stance even today. And that's because uh, when people wear the gakti, they are aware of the potential consequences that uh, making one own sami identity visible may bring. Um, actually, Sami people have been and are still object of harassment and violence, as this uh, happened while I was there in uh, September last year. A Sami, was, uh, a Sami boy was hit because he was wearing a gakti as his sister wedding by a drunk man. So for these reasons, like these kind of episodes have happened and occurred for a long time. And for these reasons, Sigmund Skoden, who is also the person behind Mararika along with your Nango, organized the Sami uh, Beavi, the day of the, the Gakti Beavi, the day of uh, the Gakti, to um, encourage people to wear the Gakti on normal occasions uh, during the day, just to make it normal to be a Sami and to be proud of it, uh, proud of it uh, during daily life in Trumso. Uh, Sami identity is visible though on a very specific uh, uh, period of time, and this is the Sami Vaku or the Sami Week in Trumso. Uh, first uh, second week of February, uh, when there is also the celebration for uh, the Sami uh, National Day. This is the only temporal space uh, and uh, uh, it lasts for less than 10 days. Sami people though are visible, even though this kind of visibility may not always be positive, uh, as this is the case uh, with the Yoikabol. These are meatballs, uh, which have only a very small, small percentage of uh, reindeer meat. And they have been advertised using these uh, stereotypical images, such as uh, this uh, racist depiction of a Sami, which draws on uh, stereotypes such as the Sami as simple and funny. Um, this is actually a very racist uh, uh, depiction, and many Sami still feel very offended by it. Another aspect of the visibility of Sami or the invisibility of Sami is the presence or absence of place names in the area. Place names were erased uh, when Norwegians settled and started to give Norwegian names to places. So in a way, by giving Norwegian names, uh, 
they were erasing the memory of Sami and the Sami history of the areas. The superimposition of Norwegian place names upon the Sami ones, uh, or the exclusion of the latter from records and maps, has changed uh, violently the linguistic landscape of northern Norway. Uh, today, there are many people who fight to get back the place names, and when it happens, sometimes they are met with a strong resistance from the same community, the members from the same community, who themselves may have been Sami and may have interiorized this kind of shame. And for these reasons, every time they um, make new road signs with the Sami name on it, these are object of vandalization, as in this case, or actually actual violence. Here, they actually shot against the Guy Watna, the co the uh, Sami name, Guy Watna. So there are also debates about uh, giving uh, Trunso uh, a Sami name. Trunso has already a Sami name, which is Ramsa, but to make it uh, uh, more visible. So I would like to just briefly address now, if I still have a bit of time, um, the um, school in uh, Medarica, school are uh, supposed here to be only uh, speaking Sami. And what I find it interesting is that uh, here school are seen as uh, tools of empowerment. In the past, though, they were tools of uh, assimilation. So Sami children were forcibly removed from their families, uh, brought uh, into these uh, Norwegian schools, uh, and they were removed from their cultures, uh, forced to speak Norwegian, and they uh, were also forced to forget their own language. So, to conclude, I would like to uh, show this slide and say that uh, the Merarika project promotes uh, awareness about the actual needs of Sami people living in the city, the so-called B-Summer, Sami of town. It's a provocative and uh, creative way of presenting a utopic, albeit very much unrealistic, Sami space carved in the urban fabric of the most important Arctic city of Norway. It is, in the end, a political statement. It's also offering a problematization of how indigeneity may be turned into brand, fostering a class divide within indigenous communities. So in the end, art in its various expressions has emerged as a tool for resistance for Sami people, bringing some indigenous voices in the public arena after they had for a very long time relegated to invisibility. Nevertheless, it's important to stress that not all Sami artists are politically engaged, even though political engagement is very much in, an important aspect of contemporary Sami art. As we can see from this image from Marta and Sara, these are reindeer heads and a piece of art is called Pilo Sapmi, and it's connected to political struggle for uh, her own brother's uh, reindeer um, herd. So. I would like to thank you very much and uh, um, to thank also my interlocutors who provided me with important insights into this project. Okay, thank you for your uh, presentation. So now we are moving to the next um, speaker. And the next speaker is uh, Ms. Claudia Muka, uh, uh, who will be talking uh, about invisible minority disabled writers uh, in Polish literature after 1989. Today I'm going to discuss um, conditions of presence of writers with disabilities in Polish literary culture after the democratic transition of 1989. Uh, in the talk I'm also trying to answer the question to what extent textual representations of disability might influence Polish literary culture after the year 1990. Uh, nine. Here is um, outline of my today's talk. Firstly, uh, I will briefly explain why the year 1989 is the turning point for literary culture in Poland. Secondly, I will uh, describe minority-oriented tendencies um, uh, that appear in the Polish book market, applying uh, uh, the Pierre Bourdieu's theory of the fields of cultural production. What I will discuss next is the issue of writers with disabilities as being an invisible minority aspiring to emancipate that needs to become more um, visible. Visible. I would, like to, I would also like to draw your attention to non-literary components that determine uh, their struggle to gain recognition and establish a representation of personal experience of disability. And finally, I will summarize my presentation. So you probably know uh, the democratic transition of 1989 in Poland brought crucial paradigm shifts uh, in political, social, and cultural spheres. I'd like to underline the fact that democratic 
change also influenced the field of literary culture. Polish fictional and non-fictional literature began to explore the collapse of communist regime, the fact that uh, it also explored the fact that uh, as a nation we faced the crucial development of our political and social consciousness and also the fact that post-communist reality will actually become um, a challenging project and a formative experience for many generations. Uh, I'd like to put an emphasis on the fact that uh, democratic transition was followed by social uh, emancipatory drive that led to emancipation of minority groups such as people with uh, disabilities. Uh, disabled people are often described as as the biggest minority uh, in the world. And this is uh, the idea that I uh, apply here uh, when I'm saying that mm, people with disabilities are a minority. Uh, literature is currently um, answering uh, to this drive. The number of books, a number of books on disability significantly uh, increased. We observe that especially non-fictional um, literature devoted to the experience of disability is getting more and more recognition and appreciation. Let me just give you one example. Uh, Jacek Hope's uh, nonfiction narratives on mothers of uh, disabled children um, were published in 2018, uh, so quite recently, and his another book on HDHD, Social View, and experiences of uh, parents or caregivers, uh, caregivers of children with HDHD was published in 2020. This uh, emancipatory drive developed in the 90s, resulting in introduction of minority issues into literary culture of Poland. In addition, gradually develop, developing liberal order supported the process of emancipation of various minority groups uh, due to the fact that democracy is an environment that seems to offer to everybody the right to speak and uh, the right to uh, act in favor of the community that a speaker or a writer belongs to. But let us also have in mind that access to narration might be, um, in fact, unequally distributed in the realm of literary culture. The following parts of my presentation are trying to cover this problem uh, using the uh, Bouges theory of the field. In order to establish a theoretical setting for analysis um, of the scope of visibility of disabled writers in Poland, in Poland I'd like to apply a frame of uh, Bouges' theory on emerging autonomous literary field or fields. Uh, field of culture in general, the scene of intersections and interrelations of activities performed by actors in the, of the field, such as writers, um, publishers, or representatives of public culture institutions. And the position of a particular actor is negotiated in the process of creating and sharing products of literary and literary oriented production. The main objective of literary production is to gain autonomy in the field. Uh, autonomy is a state in which the literary field is independent from external forces, which is uh, economy, for example, uh, whereas the heteronomy, which is an opposite of autonomy, uh, determines the state in the field in which external forces strongly influence the field and significantly modify its structure. The term uh, habitus uh, will be uh, applied um, later in this presentation. Um, so here, um, Boudier's theory is vital uh, due to the fact that, firstly, it shows that literary field is a structure uh, in which various subjects and various forces interact. Secondly, Bourdieu irrefutably, irrefutably proves that culture production depends on symbolic and economic forces that people or institutions have. Thirdly, and his theory pays attention to mechanisms of gaining dominance in the field of culture and distributing uh, distributing symbolic and economic capital within the field. This helps us to understand how some elements of our culture works and learn how to describe complicated connections between fields of culture. Now I'd like to 
uh, initially described the field of um, literature on minor experiences, referring to the Bourdieu's theory I have already uh, briefly explained. When I use the phrase minor experiences, I mean um, experiences that vi various minorities share and experiences that were um, uh, in some, well, in some points of, of time, um, publicly invisible or non-present or deprived of uh, attention. Uh, literature on uh, minor experiences can be described as a subfield of literary fields um, and or simply as a part of the literary field to provide attention. Up to some point in time, narratives on minorities and their experiences were not frequently present in the field of literature. They hold a minor position within the field of literature. However, after the democratic transition of 1989, a lot has been done in order to expand the visibility of minor experiences and its artistic representations. Simply, the democratic environment invigorated the process of emancipation of minorities, uh, which happened also through and thanks to literature. Now we are observing a series of uh, emancipatory actions performed in the field of literatures, actions or activities that change the position of minor, uh, minor literature and as a result change the structure of literary field. In the following parts of the talk I'd like to explain why and in what way it is happening, focusing on three uh, emancipatory gestures presented in the forms of autobiographical narratives. Um, let us consider uh, three uh, narratives that are based on author's uh, personal experience of intellectual or physical disability. I will try to juxtapose uh, these narrations, avoiding detailed analysis that will just cloud the main point of the talk. I'm going to consider Michal Dombrowski's novel Dwoni, The Hand, Karolina, uh, Karolina Viktor's short narrative Vogel przez Afasia, uh, through Aphasia by Volga in English, and Maria uh, Raymond's essay uh, Nie przywitam się z Państwem na ulicy, um, which in English will, will, uh, can be translated as I will not greet you in the street. I wish to claim that these three narratives are forms of emancipation of a particular experience of disability. They are also a signs of significant shift, opening up our literary culture for minor experiences and providing a discursive space for critical voices of excluded groups of people. But how these uh, narratives become uh, a part of literary culture, how they become visible? So these are the questions that I'm going to answer now. Firstly, personal narration is becoming visible when it's published. This seems the most obvious method of ma making something uh, visible or present or available. When a literary piece is published, it is exposed to comments, criticism, affirmative voices and narrations that answer to this uh, literary piece, for example, literary reviews. So basically, it's, uh, this piece uh, starts to circulate in a particular discursive sphere. The narratives that, I, uh, that I'm going to draw your attention to were published in the last decade. Dombrowski's novel was published in 2011, Victor's novels, novel was published in 2014, and Raymond's book was released in 2019. These three books appeared in the second decade of the 21st century, of the 21st century introducing vital narrations on experience of disability to Polish literary culture. Of course, after the democratic transition, a lot of narratives on disability has been published, but I have chosen three, uh, just three that illustrate the problem of visibility and invisibility of disabled writers in um, a multi-dimensional way. I'd like to underline the fact that these three narratives supported growing emancipatory tendency in Polish literary culture have been uh, 1989. Significant is the fact that this emancipatory tendency is fueled mostly by autobiographical narratives. I will comment on this fact a bit later in this presentation. And now I will briefly comment on emancipatory aspects of these uh, three 
narratives that I use as a good ex as examples here. Uh, Michal Dabrowski's Edwan is a novel based on autobiographical facts. This is a story of a boy who was born without his left hand. He constantly confronts himself with a creep body that is extremely visible because of that creepness. Uh, that means lack of, of hand. Uh, the novel introduces the question of uh, perceiving a disabled body and pays attention to the fact that visibility is connected with a notion of normal and abnormal body. Perception of disability is vis visual representations and political visibility of a disabled body also play a part in Dombrowski's literary analysis of his own experience of physical disability. I move on. Uh, for a while to Carolina Victor's novel Vogel as Aphasia and her narrative uh, introduces a, pa a personal story of post-stroke life. Aphasia in her book is both a physical state, a state of our brain, and the place where identity is being rebuilt after the stroke. Uh, Victor's story is a part of a larger autobiographical project that consists of a number of artistic performances. Her novel was the first Polish autobiographical narration on aphasia that introduced the theme of losing memory after the brain stroke, losing a sense of identity and losing an ability to use language and to communicate meaning and to express emotions. Victor's novel supports the aim of emancipation but by proving that it is possible to get back to language and to yourself via narration and the practice of storytelling. Victor's intellectual disability profoundly influenced her work, including tools that she used. For the purpose of her art, she created a new alphabet that indicate a lack of something. This feeling of lack is the most common experience during aphasia. Here, uh, here is a picture that shows what the alphabet looks like. It's, it is um, a missing alphabet that, that represents the experience of aphasia. Lastly, I'd like to draw your attention to Maria Raymond's uh, essay entitled um, I will not greet you in the street. This literary piece is also based on personal experience. Uh, Raymond is visually impaired uh, ethnographer carrying out research on experiences of women with Turner syndrome. She confronts her, uh, her own experience of having sight disability with other women's experiences um, of disability, but um, what she really does is presenting a series of observations related to a process of becoming a disabled person, a person and confronting to the view of disability that is deeply rooted in our understanding of society and its structure. Uh, Raymond uh, makes a reliable autobiographical sketch on the situation of disabled uh, women and disabled researchers, drawing our attention to the fact that observation and empathy towards other people are essential in the process of emancipatory activity. Uh, well, uh, one may ask well, why mm, autobiographical narratives become so popular among um, disabled writers in the 90s and in uh, the beginning of the 21st century. I have mentioned uh, earlier that emancipatory tendency in Polish literature, literary culture um, after the year 1989, this was fueled mostly by autobiographical narratives. According to Thomas Kauser, uh, autobiography is a literary genre that needs a particular social political setting. Uh, autobiography, uh, autobiography needs democracy, in other words. Um, uh, he suggested that personal narration might become a powerful narrative tool, introducing some facts and promoting social changes on condition that it was established and presented in a democratic environment that supports emancipation of minority. Um, Polish literary, literary culture after the democratic transitions uh, widely opened up on uh, autobiographical narratives that supported a transitory movement in contemporary Polish culture up to 1989. Um, 
Now I, I would like to move on to uh, some more complete, complex issues on inequality and invisibility that can be traced within the field of narratives and minor experiences. Uh, what I did up to this point of presentation was establishing um, a broad uh, positive image of transition that our literary culture came through. I draw your attention to emancipatory potential of narratives and you may you might have a feeling that I'm trying to convince you that um, a literary field is a democratic, democratic space where personal experience just speaks, uh, speaks up and where change of a view of disability happens. Well, uh, as I was saying at the beginning, the field of culture is a sphere of intersection between various subfields, actors, institutions, and their interests and capitals, as, as uh, Boudia would put it. When we deepen into analysis of different aspects of minority literature and its production, we will see and be able to describe what the process of establishing a visible, a strong position in the field of literature look like, and what elements decide on whether some narrative is visible, important, or invisible. That means absent, silent, deprived of deprived of uh, emancipatory potential or mm, non-influential narrative. Um, I I'd like to briefly consider the question of promotion, distribu distribution and habitus uh, of the author. These three components determine the uh, emancipatory potential of a particular narrative. The potential of emancipation and visibility after the narrative is being published is dependent significantly on the scope of promotion and distribution uh, that a particular uh, publisher have. In other words, the book that was not promoted in the media or uh, not distributed in a book market might disappear. So promotion and distribution is a necessary element of making liter literature on minor experiences visible. Uh, when we take into consideration promotion and distribution, potential of publishing houses uh, by which these uh, three exemplary narratives that I included in the stock were published, we might notice that only one narrative, uh, Maria Reyman's essay, was published by um, a strong um, um, actor of Polish book market by Tarnap publishing house, which has a strong position in the book market and significant economic and symbolic capital. Uh, publishers that released books of Victor and Dombrowski uh, have less significant position in Polish book market, which leads us to the conclusion that, conclusion that Raymond's uh, narrative has a bigger potential to become a well-known narrative and uh, not disappear in the book market and in the literary field. What also needs to be considered is a, a habitus of the author. This term is borrowed, borrowed again from Bourdieu's theoretical dictionary and refers to social dispositions that uh, author have and the social and cultural, cultural environment that the author operate within uh, and that have uh, and the environment that have uh, influence on his activities. I was discussing the habitus, and this is the, the last idea that I would like to discuss here, and then I will move to, to, con to conclusion. Um, the habitus also might influence the scope of visibility of author practices, including books that authors, authors have published. Let us consider and compare the fact that Carolina Victor, uh, before she wrote her Vogel Tresophasia, she was a prominent performance artist, well known in critical art circles. I claim that an initial initial recognition that author uh, has before his book is published influenced the reception of the book and its emancipatory uh, revealing potential. Dombrowski's, uh, on the other hand, didn't get recognition in Polish book market. He's not present in the field. He disappeared as a public figure whereas uh, Raymond has a different kind of recognition as a researcher, so reception of her book will have a different course. Uh, while moving on uh, closing remarks, I'd like to put emphasis on um, the fact that visibility of an author or his literary project depends 
not only on literary value of the book, but also strongly depends on non-literary elements of a heterogeneous field of culture. Literature on minor experience also needs to comply with the rules of promotion and distributions that uh, constitute the field of literature in contemporary Poland. If it does so, it will gain a chance to move from minor uh, to even dominant position. It means that literature of um, particular um, emancipatory and literary value will gain a recognition and truly uh, influence the way in which people perceive, for example, disability or other um, uh, minor experiences. If particular experiences in a democratic environment are going to be revealed or made visible in the form of a narrative, it needs to um, follow the rules of literary field. I believe that analysis of this particular practice of establishing a narration in the field of uh, com contemporary culture allows us to recognize what rules of cultural, social, and economic capital performatively determine the presence of minor experiences in a public sphere. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you for your contribution. So let's uh, move uh, on to the question, uh, to the mm -hmm. question and the discussion part. Uh, so let's start with uh, the first speaker. We've got uh, some questions posted in the chat room. The first question is, uh, do Sami identify themselves as being connected with the Sami group in Finland, Sweden or Greenland, or uh, their identity is different, and this is just another oppressive perspective that all of the Sami are similar. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Okay, fantastic. So, uh, thank you for this question, because it allows me to address an issue that I didn't have the time to tackle earlier. So, well, the Sami are actually not an homogeneous group. Um, there are at least uh, now seven languages, uh, semi seven languages, uh, and there are different uh, um, Sami cultures uh, uh, across the Sapomi, which is a huge, huge uh, area. Uh, nevertheless, the Sami since the 20th century have been working towards uh, a kind of a pan-Sami uh, identity. So there is like a local Sami identity, and then there is also this kind of a shared Sami identity, regardless of the um, uh, era of, of origins or the kind of activity that they practice. Uh, so, of course, uh, um, the Sami living in Trumso do share um, this kind of uh, shared identity with the Sami in other regions. And I would also like uh, to stress that uh, the Sami who live now in Trumso, most of them have moved there uh, because of uh, work or for uh, studying at the university. There are very few people who are originally from there. Um, even though, like, especially in the area, the Sami used to travel from winter to uh, summer grazing lands, uh, so from nowadays Sweden to the coasts of uh, Norway. So this kind of high mobility also fostered the shared sense of identity, even in historical times. Uh, definitely this kind of homogenizing idea that uh, the Sami are all the same, are all reindeer herders, uh, is uh, very much uh, a product of the Western exoticizing gaze. So in a way, that's also um, an oppressive perspective. And it's also very difficult for the Sami who don't identify themselves as reindeer herders sometimes uh, to be acknowledged as Sami, not by other Samis, but uh, maybe that by Swedish uh, or Norwegians uh, or even Finnish people. So it's a very <coughs> complex issue. And uh, I think it's very important to address it, because otherwise we, I would probably and uh, also um, other scholars would uh, uh, fail to acknowledge uh, the distinctive nature of each and every community and also the agency of the individuals. Uh, so, like to give a broad uh, perspective over it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've got another question uh, to, uh, to, to, to you. Uh, uh, well, it's related to um, the processes of uh, marginalization and uh, stigmatization. Uh, um, how uh, mm, could you give some kind of real life examples of uh, of uh, of such pro processes uh, in the context of the Norwegian society? 
like how 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 do Norwegians uh, marginalize, uh, stigmatize uh, um, the Sami community, the Sami people? Um, in the past or today? Because uh, today. it has changed. Okay, because today. The past, they used uh, the schooling system. Uh, yeah, yes. Trying to mind wipe and culture uh, cleanse uh, the community. Yes. So today, of course, it's forbidden by law to stigmatize someone because of their ethnic identity uh, or religious background or a political view in Norway. But uh, on the individual level, it's still quite common that people, uh, when wearing the Gakti, are maybe uh, harassed, as I said. They may be physically harassed. Most likely, though, it's uh, uh, shouting, calling names. Uh, and uh, um, there are also there have been like uh, TV shows uh, that uh, made fun out of the Sami, uh, relying on these kind of um, depictions of them as uh, simple people, uh, maybe not too intelligent uh, or not very able to speak the Norwegian language as a proper Norwegian. In school, there have been like episodes of uh, bullism, which is uh, very uh, important to address because uh, it, it means that the children have uh, interiorized their own parents' attitude towards the Sami. So even if in the public uh, it may not be expressed, then in the private people still do um, talk about the Sami in a very negative way. And uh, in my proper experience, it happened twice that uh, while I was in Chumso, I was approached by someone and when they asked me why I was there, when I replied, they got cross with me because they said, oh, but uh, we are here too, why do you all come just for them? And another lady told me at the bus stop that uh, people would, told me, would tell me that I am in Sapmi while I am actually in Trumso, it's a Norwegian town. The Sami live up in the mountains and they are almost non-existent. So it's this kind of uh, constant negation of the Sami identity or the Sami presence in the area that is also a form of stigmatization and children suffer very much. Uh, and then of course it's very difficult to have access to um, uh, Sami uh, teachers or Sami like Sami languages uh, um, offered by law, but it's difficult sometimes to get education in Sami, and many Sami children sometimes opt for Sami as a second language because it's easier than having it as a first language. It's easier also from a logistic point of view because then the exams. Uh, everything is modeled on the Norwegian curriculum, even if the curriculum is Sami. So these are all small things, like it's this kind of structural violence that makes life difficult on the everyday level for Sami people today, even if it's Norway, which is like usually regarded as the top ranking uh, um, democracy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. And uh, another thing is uh, through the, um, but this is a completely different issue with uh, um, infrastructures uh, such as uh, mines, uh, windmills, uh, dams uh, that deeply affect uh, the Sami, but are regarded as uh, vital for the development of the country. So there is this kind of marginalization and uh, it has a very important effect on both the society and the environment. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so now um, let's switch to uh, speaker number two. And uh, the first question would be like this. Uh, what kinds of disabilities uh, get uh, mm, uh, are covered uh, in literature kind of the most? And which uh, types of disabilities are silenced or kind of... Uh, brushed aside not really treated as uh, mm, yeah not really elaborated on mm -hmm. well thank you for for this question uh you've uh, touched quite a complex issue and at the same time the issue that is uh extremely important in my phd project because i'm trying to um to trace to find um uh, what is wrong or what is what is the critical point also within the field of um, emancipatory narratives emancipatory activism and so on so um well basically in polish literature um physical disability is um more present than for example intellectual disability uh, in recent um, few years we've uh, observed um, that um, well some 
um, types of narratives uh, included or tried to include uh, both um, uh, types of disabilities, I mean, intellectual disability and physical disability. disability. So uh, we are now facing kind of um, equal um, strategies or um, well, authors are trying to, to cover as many um, experiences of disabilities as uh, possible. But up to some point in time, um, mostly uh, physical disability was was represented in literature um, because it was something which is which was um, um, in a way more visible than intellectual disability because a lot of people with intellectual disability um, well do not have uh, do not have an ability to uh, speak. Uh, in favor of themselves. They were, for example, in hospitals or uh, locked in their houses, so, and they didn't have an opportunity to speak. They, uh, well, in some, in some cases, they didn't even have an access to, to the internet, so that's, well, they can share their um, personal narrative online. So this is a um, huge, maybe not a huge, but a significant uh, disproportion in terms of uh, representing different types of disabilities. Okay, thank you. Do, do we have um, any questions to, uh, to the second speaker? Okay, not in here. Okay, uh, what about the online participants? Okay, I, I I can't see any. So let's go back to the to to the first speaker. There is a uh, a reflection um, posted in the chat room. Um, doesn't um, isn't uh, it even a problem that in the discourse about Scandinavian countries we we usually see equality and solidarity, but rarely see that this is uh, also a veil. Uh, uh, under which there is a there is discrimination, and this is even more complicated for people to say we we are not treated equally in such a country as Norway. Yeah, um, about that, I would like to just uh, um, highlight a, this is a very important issue, and uh, it's also uh, it has also to do with the concept of indigenous, uh, like acknowledging a people as indigenous, and the Norway did it uh, in uh, 1989 with the ratification of the ILO Convention 169. It's actually to acknowledge that they have also, as a people, undergone undergone a lot of uh, stigmatization. The thing is that. Uh, uh, today, some, many in the Norwegian society, especially in the north, uh, uh, claim that the Sami are uh, treated too well, that they have been given privileges. Uh, they don't acknowledge these privileges as a sort of reparation and uh, a sort of a way to uh, make things even. Like, uh, um, since uh, the Sami has been deprived of so much, now they need like uh, uh, more facilities, uh, institutions, and even like economic su um, support uh, to foster education in Sami, for instance. I was once told by a Norwegian, um, while we were just randomly talking at the bus stop, uh, bus stops have emerged as important places, uh, or known places, and um, during my field work. But anyway, this, told me, this, this guy told me that the Sami now are paid just to use Facebook. So I think it really um, epitomizes this kind of feelings that people may have. So yes, I think it's a very important uh, to, it should be addressed more and also on the outside because sometimes uh, um, it's uh, not like, you know, if you are in the Norwegian context, you are exposed sometimes to these issues, but from the outside, it doesn't really, um, you know, uh, seep through the cracks, I think. It doesn't appear on the outside. Okay, there is also a continuation. Uh, I mean that there are data that aggression against women uh, is very high in Scandinavian countries and they have a problem with raising that as a problem because so much has been done for equality. Isn't it a similar problem in case of ethnicity? Yeah. Well, 
Um, actually, with women, uh, the harassment of women, this is, I think, a slightly different uh, because that has more to do with the fact that women denounce very much uh, more than, for instance, in Italy. Like in Italy, it's uh, quite common. Like I think, uh, I don't know the statistics, but it's really high. Like uh, these are uh, projections, and it seems like one woman every five, I don't know, has been a victim of uh, some sort of harassment, but they don't denounce. So the statistics actually don't reflect this uh, kind of reality. In Norway, instead, women are more encouraged to denounce. So in that case, uh, um, this is actually um, a, cons a consequence uh, of this kind of awareness. In the case of ethnicity, instead, it's uh, deeply rooted in the colonial uh, power relationship uh, between Sami and Norwegians. So in a way, we have uh, uh, different uh, um, premises uh, for this uh, phenomena, or this is at least my opinion. Okay, thank you.